me to get us going here to Facebook. All right. And let's see. Oops. And can somebody, can Kate nod or let me know if the slides are showing properly? Yep, I see them. All right. Um, so once again, everyone, um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, hopefully you are either somewhere cool or, uh, you know, Got a, got a fan blowing on you or something. Um, we're glad you could join us for our July virtual membership meeting of the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. Um, we've got a couple of guests tonight, but we'll see how things flow and if we get done um, a little bit early or not. Um, tonight's agenda, we'll do some quick welcome and introductions. Um, I don't think we have previous meeting minutes to approve, but it's on there. Kate, did you send something and I missed it or? I sent them out, but with our new every other month schedule, it was a long time ago at this point. So maybe I'll send those out again. Yeah, we'll leave that to next time then. Um, yeah. We are going to start off with a very, I probably should have just put update rather than conversation. Um, a quick update with the Washington State Ferries about this morning's accident at the Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal. Um, hopefully this is not the first that you're hearing that something uh, happened in our neck of the woods, but apparently transportation is just uh, collapsing all around us the last couple of days. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, Washington State Ferries, you can always go to their website, which is available there on the slide. Um, we will follow that up with a conversation <laughs> with our very own District 1 Council Member, Lisa Herbold. Um, as part of a sort of ongoing series we've been having here about um, some of the uh, bicycle and pedestrian fatalities that have happened around us in West Seattle, Soto, and Georgetown, uh, Vision Zero program, um, and some of uh, the most recent updates with uh, confirmation of the new SDOT director uh, in front of us now and link light rail expansion. Um, if for some reason you have never met Lisa or heard of her, um, you can learn more at her website, which is also on the screen there. Um, and then we'll have a few other things we get to at the end before we wrap. And as uh, normally we adjourn at 8.30, as I said, we'll try and see if we can't keep moving forward and be wrapped before that. Um, purpose of the West Seattle Transportation Coalition, we are a peninsula-wide organization working to address transportation and commuting challenges for the nearly 100,000 people who live and work here on the West Seattle Peninsula. Uh, we do this by securing the support of residents, um, engaging elected officials at all levels, like we'll see us doing tonight. Um, we partner with government agencies to help get uh, updates or when they're doing community feedback or whatever, as you see this evening. Um, and we also engage with businesses, community organizations, neighborhood groups, and individuals uh, to educate and collect feedback, as we did not too long ago um, in assisting with the latest round of outreach for Sound Transit. Um, our goals are affordable and equitable transportation options, particularly in historically underserved neighborhoods, a transportation network that moves people and goods in an environmentally sustainable manner, and investments in transportation infrastructure that match Seattle's growth. Specifically, our priorities right now in 2022 um, are continuing to support um, all the different efforts underway to restore capacity in the West Seattle Bridge Transportation Corridor. We advocate for funding maximum mobility while the high bridge is closed. We support Sound Transit 3 planning, education, and outreach. And uh, we are uh, monitoring the ongoing SR-160 Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal Trestle and Span replacement project, which is underway. Um, I still have this here, but I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know how to Zoom or chat at, the, uh, at this point in, in the world we live in. Um, but uh, you will note that at the moment, chat is disabled. Um, I will turn that on uh, shortly. Um, and you can direct any questions and comments you need there during the meeting. Um, our fabulous newly, newly stepping up Vice Chair, Kate Wells, um, will be backing me up with monitoring the, uh, the chat. Um, introductions. Um, 
You know, I'm tempted to do actual introductions since we're a small group, but I don't think I will. Our practice is we sort of direct people to the chat, which I will make sure is available now. Um, we invite you to drop your name, pronouns, uh, any access needs you have, uh, neighborhood that you live in, um, and a quick answer to our fun checking question, which uh, for uh, tonight's meeting, we thought is we just go simply with what are you doing to keep cool this week? Um, if you're a guest joining us um, and you did not receive a reminder uh, last night or this morning, I think, um, from our e that means you're not on our email list. If you'd like to be on our email list, you can go into the chat window there and just send a direct message to John Wright, who is uh, also on our board, and he can make sure to get you signed up on our email list. And without um, since we don't have meeting minutes to approve. Oh, I should pause though and say, even though we're not approving meeting minutes, um, as I said, we have been loading past uh, meetings up on YouTube. It has a really awful scramble of letters there at the end because um, we're not big enough yet to brand our channel. Um, and if you're not, if you're on Facebook, you can follow us there um, and all the uh, go live meetings get categorized there in the live video, uh, video Facebook live section. Um, and without further ado, um, we will have our update with Washington State Ferries. Joining us briefly is John Vizina. 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 Perfect. Director of Planning, Government's Customer, and Government Relations with Washington State Ferries, which I'll remind people, if you didn't guess from the website there, is actually a part of WASHTA. Um, take it away, John. Thanks, Michael. And just before I start, and I would say this whether or not Councilmember Herbold was here, she is part of a group of elected officials. I update whenever anything happens on the triangle route. Um, so she and Noel from her staff um, got an email early on this morning and I kept them updated during the day. It, the office immediately reached back out, asked if there was anything they could do to help and um, wanting to be kept apprised. So just really appreciate, you know, you all know better than me, but I, I deal with elected officials throughout the sound from the San Juans down to Point Defiance. and. You know, you know, as constituents, how good she is at this stuff. But I just wanted to reiterate how much I appreciate her and her office's good work on our behalf and on your behalf. Um, this morning at 8.14, the Kath Lamet was docking at uh, Fauntleroy Terminal. It had a hard landing um, hitting one of the dolphins. Um, I did learn today, yeah, be very careful when you say that because there were people on social media who thought it had actually hit a dolphin out. This was not a live animal. It was one of the pilings at the, um, at the dock that steers and keeps the boat in to the dock. Um, there were no serious injuries um, the, to passenger or crew. Um, one passenger um, had left and came back and said, I don't know if it was a man or a woman, that he or she wanted to be um, medically assessed. So that, that was happened and a person went on their way. Um, there was one vehicle that, um, if you've seen pictures, which are fairly dramatic, um, the steel from the side of the boat kind of trapped the, um, one of the cars that couldn't be extricated. And what it may be the most Seattle bash on Fauntleroy thing ever, one of our employees went to talk to the gentleman whose car was trapped to kind of assess how he was. And he was like, you know, I'm good. I'm just going to head to work. And the person, you know, my colleague was like, well, you know, we want to talk to you about filing, filling a claim and how, how we deal with this. He's like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm sure you get in touch with me. I, I'm off to work. I'll call you later. And off he went. Um, his car is still on the boat. Um, so as is um, as required by regulation, notify the Coast Guard. We notified the National Transportation Safety Board um, and Washington State Patrol. Um, the NTSB let us know that the Coast Guard would be taking the lead and they would work alongside them on an investigation of what happened. So the Coast Guard and Washington State Patrol went to the vessel. Um, again, while there's no indication that this is an issue, um, all the employees on the boat are drug and um, alcohol tested. Um, and then the um, Coast Guard and WSP takes um, statements from everyone. Um, that took uh, you know, hours of time by the time people got to West Seattle um, and those statements were taken. Um, and we, we fairly quickly assessed that the boat was safe to leave, um, but that couldn't happen until the Coast Guard cleared it. 
So the Issaquah, um, the other boat on the route that's currently on two boat service, just kept going back and forth between Southworth and Bashan, moving people um, who wanted to go that direction. Um, we the boat on the south end of Bashan, the Point Defiance Telequa, it usually ties up at lunchtime. There's not a lot of traffic. So we crewed that so it could keep working. Um, by the end of the day, I think there were three hour plus lines um, in Point Defiance and people trying to get back to Bashan that way. It's a very small terminal. It's a short route, but um, you know, it just takes a while when you have that much traffic. I reached out to King County Metro and um, Kids Have Transit, and they all offered to augment their current their regular service to have more passenger only service directly to Bashan from Seattle. Um, they, like us, are, st are struggling with crewing challenges, so they didn't have a lot of capacity there, but um, they did add some extra service to um, to allow people to get back and forth to their homes. As you can imagine, there were people who driven, you know, walked on, taken a bus, and then were in Seattle at medical appointments or work who, who needed to get back. Um, the, the Coast Guard and WSP did their work, um, and by about 3.30, um, they were finished. So um, I think it was 3.45 or so, um, we were able to move the Cath Lamet, and it started a dance of crew members who were on board, whose cars were at other places, and we needed crew members to move to crew the second boat we were bringing down from Bremerton, the Kitsap. So um, the Kathlam went to Southworth and Bashan, and then headed to, Bank to Bainbridge to our Eagle Harbor maintenance facility, where it's now docked. Um, and because of the, the challenges of crewing that I won't bore you with, the Kitsap is now there. So the Issaquah and the Kitsap are on the route, um, they are doing all stops while the terminal supervisors and the operations staff figure out how we can drop them back into the regular two boat schedule. So for now, they're just doing circles, just clearing everyone off each dock, moving people as best we can. Um, as, as someone mentioned earlier before we all joined, at the same time this afternoon, there was a, a chemical spill on I-5, which closed I-5, which um, you know, in both directions, which may have helped somewhat because it, people weren't able to get to our terminals at all anyway. So um, not a good day for transportation in Washington state, um, but that, that's what happened today. We will tomorrow name probably a port captain. He actually lives um, in Alaska Junction um, who is responsible for this route. He will probably be our lead for our investigation as we work with the Coast Guard and WSP um, what happened. We don't have any indication yet whether it was mechanical or something that happened with the crew. So, you know, we appreciate anyone holding off on um, any conjecture there. But as always, we will be totally transparent when we have a report. And if there's things we need to do to continue safe service, we will do that. Last thing I'll say, the boat will, you know, we'll work on repairs to the boat. The, the terminal, there is some damage to the piling. But it's not thought that it's anything that, you know, we, we will begin repairs on that. It's not thought that it's um, severe enough that it will impact um, service at all. So, you know, as we get back to regular service tonight, that should be what you would expect tomorrow morning, regular alternate service with two boats. Um, so, Michael, that was a bit of a filibuster for me, but I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. I, you definitely covered all the all, all the highlights of the things I think we were going to ask. Um, I mean, I, I think it's good to remind people not to sort of conjecture too much. I will share that I'm sure you're you're hearing the same things we are. A lot of folks have pointed out that there have been some mechanical issues with the calf limit in the past and wondering if this was any sort of problem resurfacing or, or something like that. But I'm sure you guys will be looking into that. Absolutely. And, um, you know, th I, this is a particularly tough time for my colleagues who work on boats. And there's, you know, people are frustrated with our level of service. Um, as we see all around the country, people are frustrated in general. We're having some pretty nasty names and interactions with passengers and crew members. And I always, when I talk to the public, remind folks that the people who are on these boats are the people who've hung with us for the last two years. They've shown up to work when a lot of us were directed to stay at home. They go to work every day trying to their best to move people 
um, around the sound. And, you know, if people want to call and yell at me, uh, that's fair game. But I hope that they realize that folks on both are doing their level best and they lost a lot of colleagues um, to move people and that we can be respectful, even if frustrated with the people out there working on the vessels and at the terminals. All right, thank you. Um, Tracy has a question in the chat. And Jeremy has his hand raised too. So Jeremy, why don't you go first since you uh, raised your hand first? Okay. Um, so John, it, is the level of service in the whole network enough that the Kitsap can stand for as long as it's going to take to get the repairs done, or is there expected to be a bad cascade from this? Um, so the, the Kitsap, um, we do have a couple of boats out, but unfortunately slash fortunately, um, our service levels are so low at the moment. So it was at Bremerton um, as a service relief if something like this happened, but the Walla Walla has been on the Bremerton route for several weeks on its own, and the crew hasn't been able to do any maintenance. So it was actually working the last two round trips this week to allow maintenance to be done on the Walla Walla, which tied up early. But we expect by Wednesday another boat that um, is off the Bainbridge route to be repaired and back in service. So we should be totally fine having the Kitsap on this route as the second boat um, when the Tacoma goes back in, the Cleeton, which is on Seattle Bainbridge, can go and hang out at Bremerton helping there. So um, we don't want to lose any more, but for right now, we're okay. That's a great question, Jeremy. Thank you. Okay, so you're still within relief tolerance, but you're running out of boats. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well said. All right, question from the chat. Um, since it seems the dock is okay without the damaged dolphin, what is its usual function? So it is one, uh, that's a good question too, that it's one of several dolphins that is there to help you know, pull in. One of the things that's something that you know, as technology improves, we wanna look at, if you've been on our boats and probably most of you have, when we go into a dock, we push the dock. That means we're, we're using fuel um, and unfortunately emitting greenhouse gas that, um, to keep the boat steady. So the dolphins are there with the wing walls to kind of guide the boat in. And then once we are docked, we just keep pushing with the engine to keep it in place. So it helps with that. The one that was damaged today is on the outside. It's not one of the inner ones. So it's one sort of the first ones, if you go down there, you'll see. Um, so it's, it's necessary in general for the stability of the dock um, for keeping the boat there but it's not so damaged that it can't do that function. Um, but you know, you obviously don't want anything that's been hit with steel to not be repaired and, you know, once it's dinged, so they'll be doing that repair work. Um, I will say, because most of us in this area care about the environment, there is some new technology in places like using magnets that pull a boat in and then hold it in place so you don't have to use the, um, you know, you don't have to be pushing the dock the whole time. And, using that fuel. And that's, that's definitely stuff that our vessels engineering department's looking at for the future. That's technology we're looking at. Do you have any guesses on when it might get repaired, like a ballpark? I, I don't, it's so early. Um, yeah. it, I have heard from my colleagues, they think it's repair that can be done. Um, it doesn't take a dry dock. It doesn't, doesn't have to be removed from the water from where it is. And dry dock space not only means time, it's, there's limited dry dock space in Puget Sound. There aren't many places you can do it. So whether it can be done at Eagle Harbor is gonna have to move somewhere else. Um, you know, we'll be obviously looking to do that work as soon as possible, as well as extricating the gentleman from Bashan's car from under the steel and either repairing it, returning it to him, or you know, compensating him in some way. All right, I'm at the end of the questions. So, Michael? All right. I'm gonna uh, jump in real quick. This oh, is Deb, sorry. I just am gonna ask the, the naturalist question. Well, while you're doing that, I'm gonna show. Uh, yeah. I, I stole these from 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 Tracy, who, who's right. giving credit there. But uh, if folks haven't seen some pictures there, um, here's some pictures. And and I get, I'm guessing this is the gentleman's car. Maybe that that's trapped there, John. No, I think it's um, you actually can't see it. It's to the right of the red oh. one. It's actually white. 
Uh, oh, there you can. Sorry, you can see it in that other one. Yeah. So this this term of dolphin, um, can you do you happen to know where that comes from? The term dolphin when it's used in a pier situation instead of a fish situation. That is a great question that I'm going to quickly stall and look up on Google. Oh, I could have um, done that, but okay. I just thought it was like, you know, maybe a test question when you got here um, by Washdot or something, or, or the fairies, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, um, the director of planning customer government relations has not asked that question. I bet people who work on the, the boat are. Okay. So. Yeah, it was uh, super confusing to, to go, wait, a dolphin and I can see what and there Jeremy is beach to it. Yeah. No, that um it definitely <laughs> was concerning to folks. Okay. Wikipedia didn't have the etymology of it, but I assume it's that it guides the vessel in in a way that makes boat captains happy. Okay. <laughs> tricky, tricky. I mean it's like the 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 language like you know the area at the front of the boat that goes out and you dock is the pickle fork. Like what? There's, yeah, there's just bizarre language all the way around. It's kind of cute. I'm never going to feel the same way about pickles. Okay. <laughs> I really well, appreciate well. the opportunity to talk to you all. And I know my colleague Hadley, who, you know, she lives in West Seattle. I know she's talked to you about the terminal project. And I think she's a mile, maybe two away. She heard it at her house. So folks who are around the terminal, it was definitely not a surprise that something major had happened. All right, Thanks, Michael. Um, if there are no other questions, we will let John wrap up what I'm sure has been a busy day. <laughs> and, and you know, to your first question, I was born and brought up in Alaska. There is nothing above 65 degrees that makes me be cool. So I'm going to go retreat into something now. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much for jumping in at such short notice. You're welcome. Thank you all. Good night. All right. And with that, um, oops, that didn't work. Um, I will. What a day. Get us underway here. Well, since yeah. Tracy's here, I'm gonna thank Tracy for having the, the uh, footage and the uh, traffic control transcript from the uh, the other water issue that we that West Seattle had this week with the plane going in at Alki. That was fascinating to watch. Um, yes, I have I have a picture. I have pictures of that later on in the presentation. Oh, okay. We're, we're having quite the transportation week around Seattle. <laughs> um, but uh, moving along in our agenda, um, we, it's been a while since we have had her with us, and so it is great to have her back again. Um, a conversation with our, uh, our own District 1 Council Member, Lisa Herbel. Um, we, as I said at the top of uh, the meeting, um, you know, we, we've kind of been in having a series of conversations right now. Um, a lot of us here in the Southwest, as well as a lot of our, our friends um, and, and some of uh, Council Member Herbold's colleagues um, over in Southeast Seattle, um, are likewise concerned about uh, bicycle and pedestrian fatalities that have been happening. It seems like they're happening more this year. Um, well, what's going on with our Vision Zero program and if we need to perhaps uh, lean in even more into some of the goals of that program. Um, we will talk a little bit later um, about the name, uh, Mayor Harold just named a new SDOT director. So hopefully um, the council member can talk a little bit about you know, what, what things are shaping up, she thinks, for the confirmation process, what that might look like uh, at the council. And then we can also talk a little bit about um, some of um, her comments that she shared uh, at the council, recent council meeting and uh, the official comments that city council submitted to Sound Transit about light rail expansion, especially uh, some of her comments here about uh, Del Ridge and Avalon. Um, so uh, take it away, council member Her Her Herbold. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I'm getting some uh, evening sunlight. Uh, I hope it's okay. It's unusual, but I, you can all see me, I think. Um, appreciate being with you here today virtually. And um, yeah, I hope everybody's 
finding ways to keep cool. I didn't add anything in the chat because I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, appreciate uh, getting some context or some contours, I should say, um, of what you're hoping that um, I address today, uh, specifically um, the Vision um, Zero program and specific to that program, the um, efforts that SDOT is engaged in, in particular locations here in West Seattle in response to a recent um, spate of um, tragic deaths. As we know, um, in May, there was a pedestrian um, that died um, on the intersection of California and Southwest Finley um, in March. Um, somebody died, um, a pedestrian died uh, at 2nd Avenue in Highland Park. Uh, cyclist Robert Mason died near the Spokane Street Bridge in a hit and run uh, just last week. Uh, there was a death of a cyclist earlier this year. Um, and so um, SDOT does have a Vision Zero program that when things like this happen, and that Vision Zero program is focused on um, locations that have already been identified uh, through engineering studies and analysis and citizen requests to focus on certain areas. But when tragic things like this happen, um, those uh, the, the funding uh, and the priorities have to shift to look at those, those locations. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about two of the locations where I've recently received an, an update from SDOT. Um, but first, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what uh, the engineering evaluation um, that SDOT does at these locations after crash crashes and, and sort of components um, of, of that evaluation. They consider several factors. They consider traffic volumes, uh, turning move um, movement counts. They consider the number of people using um, the area, people walking, people biking, uh, transit ridership in the areas. They consider travel speeds, roadway geometry, adjacent land uses, the proximity to area um, neighborhood greenway connections, potential school crossings, uh, other nearby signalized crossing opportunities that might be in the area, um, existing intersection traffic tool, um, uh, tools that are already in place. Of course, the collision here uh, history of the intersection. And so um, for um, a couple of these locations, SDOT has, has done that, um, that engineering evaluation and has shared some improvements that they're, that they're going to be implementing for um, specifically for the California Avenue Southwest. They're gonna upgrade the yellow flashing beacons uh, at the intersection uh, from flashing beacons to instead uh, a pedestrian half signal that can be activated uh, with push buttons and will stop traffic on California Southwest with a red signal indication. Um, they're also going to be uh, implementing a curb bulb in the south, east, and northwest quadrants. And the intention there in, in adding that painted curb bulb is to improve sight lines uh, for the pedestrians that are crossing. Um, they're also going to be adding a median island on the south leg of California Avenue Southwest. Um, and again, that is intended to prevent um, the use of this center lane as a through lane, potentially reduce uh, speeds, um, and just to sort of impact the open feel of California Avenue Southwest to, to uh, impact driver behavior. Um, both of these changes, uh, they are um, have existing funding uh, to do the work. They're going to be um, using uh, funding that uh, from existing programs, including the Levy to Move Seattle, uh, and they are um, saying that they intend to deliver both sets of improvements, both the signalized 
uh, the pedestrian half signal and um, the curb bulb and uh, median island by the end of this year. Um, moving over to the um, hit and run of the cyclist, Mr. Mason, um, at the south of uh, the Spokane Street Bridge. Um, and just noting that he is um, the 13th person to die from a collision on Seattle streets uh, this year. Um, and, you know, we're only through July. Um, as described before, they, being SDOT, evaluates the sites from an engineering perspective. And uh, for this particular location, um, SDOT has proposed some safety improvements this week, uh, specifically a project to redesign uh, Fourth Avenue South near Holgate, uh, including a new median island to reduce conflicts between transportation modes um, and um, mitigate impacts of exposure and reduce, and they'll also be reducing the speed limit on Fourth Avenue from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. Um, there have been seven fatalities within a quarter mile radius of this particular intersection, Fourth South and South Holgate in the last uh, two and a half years. Um, and as we know, um, you know, we care about the safety of everybody in our city, but um, this particular corridor is really important to District 1 residents who pass through Soto to get to Georgetown. Um, and so um, there are some other projects that um, we've been working on and I've been um, helping to get funding for, uh, for cyclists and, and pedestrians in that corridor, including the uh, West Marginal uh, project, uh, again, that's focused on the corridor between West Seattle and downtown. There's also the Georgetown to South Park connection and the Georgetown to downtown project. So um, these are all uh, really important projects to, to make uh, progress on. I appreciate uh, my colleague, um, as was mentioned um, by Michael, um, Councilmember Morales has been doing a lot of advocacy um, with the support of the transportation chair um, because um, Southeast Seattle has also uh, been experiencing um, a, a state of, um, of collisions and, and, and fatalities. Um, so, you know, this is definitely an area of important important focus for, for our city, important focus for advocates um, like the coalition and important to talk about in our conversations moving into the fall budget deliberations as well. Um, I could pause here or I could just uh, move on through to the um, process on the, um, the new SDOT director. Um, it looks like we have at least one question in the chat about Vision Zero, so why don't we pause there? Uh, you got that, Kate? Yep. So according to the SDOT Vision Zero team, they've identified many more safety improvements throughout the city than there is funding for. What can be done to get more money for safety? I, I would say uh, your um, strong advocacy during the council's budget process this year. Um, I think, you know, some of the some of the projects that I mentioned towards the end of my comments, uh, specifically um, the Georgetown South Town uh, South section and the Georgetown to downtown projects, we were able to add additional funding beyond what, what had already been programmed and recommended by the previous administration the council was able to add funding to those projects, um, but we're only able to do it because of, um, again, uh, folks coming forward and participating in the budget process and telling us um, how important, how much of a priority it is to you. We have a lot of different priorities to balance during the budget process. When the mayor proposes a balance, uh, a budget, it is balanced. So there's no extra money. And so um, when we get it, in order to add things that are important to you, um, we have to cut things. And so that it's, it, it is easier for us to do that 
um, if we have people coming out and telling us how important um, these projects are. Uh, I can, uh, another project that I've I was able to uh, be uh, a successful in my role as a council member advocate only because um, I was able to lift the voices of folks in um, in uh, District One is when um, all of the um, District One community groups got together through the um, District One community network. Um, and were unified in their support for the Duwamish uh, Longhouse um, uh, Crossing Safety Project. And so that's, a, again, um, an example of when um, the entire district is unified on um, some specific improvements. Um, that's really helpful, but it's also really helpful. And I, I understand your, your question, Kate, is maybe not advocating about individual projects, but advocating for more funding in a program that affects the entire city. Um, and in that case, you know, I think getting being in good contact with uh, citywide groups is is who are advocating around um, transportation infrastructure improvements is is really helpful. Uh, groups like Seattle Greenways, um, they're very, very active uh, folks for folks who are um, concerned um, about um, pedestrian Im improvements. Um, there is um, uh, an advocacy group um, that I know Marcy works with um, that does an amazing job of uh, uplifting how um, uniquely uh, unsafe sidewalks and pedestrian crossings um, impact people who um, have ability challenges. Um, and so, you know, there's, there are different ways you can go, right? It, you can you can become an advocate for a specific project that you care deeply about in, in your neighborhood and work with your neighbors to, 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 to work on that. Um, or you can try to work citywide with the citywide advocates who are working on these things. Okay. Uh, we've got two hands raised. So Deb first and then Dawn. Councilmember Herbo, thank you so much for attending uh, WSTC. It's great to see you again. Um, I ironically was at a, I probably like a lot of meetings today. And you were at the 16th I, Avenue meeting today, weren't you? I was at the 16th Avenue Southwest Traffic Safety Meeting, and it was um, it was really great to have SDOT come out and meet with that community uh, who, who are, they're still, uh, understanding and learning about what's possible and what's not. The community is uh, requested the meeting because one of their brand new flashing uh, uh, signals, uh, flashing uh, pedestrian signals uh, has been destroyed by a speeder who wrapped himself around that. And, uh, and ironically, parts are on back order for replacement. So um, no one knows when that's gonna be replaced. Um, and, and that neighborhood was a bit frustrated to hear that any more funding through the Reconnect West Seattle program is coming to an end uh, for their concerns. So I'm gonna be encouraging this neighborhood to come up with other ways to try and get some traffic calming uh, going in their neighborhood. One of them, I mean, even they'll be doing the orange flags to cross the street, things like that. The uh, Not only just the, the residents, but the college is very concerned about that as well because they do, they, the college anticipate more students coming in person. Uh, school starts in a month. Um, yeah. It's not going to yeah. go back to what it was, but it's going to get there eventually. And, yeah, and, and I, uh, you know, I appreciate that SDOT has been doing some work on that street when they hadn't planned to. Yes. Um, and, but that was only because of that advocacy, um, and I appreciate that even though it, that is not your neighborhood, Deb, that you have been uh, lending your um, advocacy ex expertise to this group. It's really invaluable uh, to learn these kinds of leadership skills about how to deal with the bureaucracy. Yeah. Um, no, no, from my office wasn't on that meeting. I haven't had a chance to debrief with him. I had not heard, um, I mean, I know SDOT has been saying, that they're winding down yeah. 
um, re reconnect uh, West Seattle and those projects. But I understand there's so money left in the budget. So they're, they're, they're doing little bits, but that, you know, they're like, well, you know, this is a probably our last I meeting. believe there are still, there's still money in that budget. So you, they don't have to call it reconnect West Seattle. That's what I told I believe, them. I believe that there's still money in that budget and I'm going to be asking That's um, That's what how it's still left there and how we can reprogram it to continue to use it on That's the great. peninsula. Perfect. Love to hear that. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, Don, go ahead. Hi. Thanks, uh, Council Member Hergold, for all of your work in responding to advocacy and um, doing the right thing for transportation in West Seattle and, and for all of Newell's work too on your staff. Um, I think, um, I mean, I have a lot of concerns right now, and I'm kind of nonplussed by all the uh, uh, hit and run accidents, especially hit and run collisions with pedestrians and bike riders. Uh, there, there are specific um, infrastructure things we can we can do and advocate for that all make sense, um, like the crossings on California, and uh, there's a little set of things around Terminal 18 and South Spokane Street that we've advocated for in the Reconnect West Seattle program that were not uh, have not yet been implemented that might uh, help people on bikes make the loop under the bridge instead of the street crossing there uh, more safely. Um, and and attention the vision zero staff at SDOT is great they, and when they've done things like work on west marginal way uh, or an east marginal way project um, they're doing a great job um, the uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety analysis that the city does is has done in a couple of iterations is really proactive and worth following but the overall funding is is not enough, as Kate has mentioned. Um, and then I think even where we have great infrastructure, like, like at, at Spokane Street at that crossing, there are um, bike activated uh, signals, red lights, um, uh, other places where we've had recent fatal and, and serious injury collisions, uh, like, um, and, and have infrastructure like those flashing beacons, people have driven right through that great infrastructure because they're speeding. And um, it seems like the slogan Vision Zero is, I, I advocated against that when it first came up and I still think it's a mistake. Um, uh, Vision Zero is a slogan and if you follow, uh, Edward Deming's advice from the 1920s as he uh, kind of reorganized American industries and then in Japan after World War II helped develop the powerhouses of Toyota and other companies. One of his 14 points for success is avoid sloganeering and because all it does is make people feel bad that, mm -hmm. that they haven't done a good job. Mm -hmm. um, when something happens that's really out of everybody's control. Yeah. Um, and then the tendency is to throw out a good program uh, because, uh, because it looks like a failure if you're going for zero defects or, or vision zero. Yeah. Um, there's never going to be zero defects yeah. in any uh, program and it, and it works against having feedback from employees um, to improve programs. So, yeah. so I think that's a mistake. Not I, yeah, I, <laughs> Don, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I really do. I mean, um, completely different policy issue, but the Regional Homelessness Authority, um, as it relates to its um, work to address um, unsheltered homelessness downtown, they're, they're calling it Partnership for Zero. Yeah, um, and before that, it was in homelessness in 10 years, and in yeah, 10 years... Yeah. Yeah. The ten years I mean, went by, and it was. I'm not. I'm not inherently against slogans, but they should not be slogans that are based on uh, on 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 goals that are um, not realistic. Yeah, and yeah. then 
I, what I'm most concerned about right now is just is really for traffic safety is the social isolation that is happening that makes people not uh, aware or not care that they're driving uh, a two ton to 10 ton vehicle that has deadly consequences if they are inattentive or or uh, reckless. Um, and I don't know what to do about that. I mean, that that it seems like it's right now based on the pandemic, based on West Seattle's social isolation from the city and impatience. And uh, no, it's and like just, Don, uh, Don uh, from Washington State Ferries was saying too. It's like you know, people's kindness and consideration to one another um, is definitely um, at a low ebb. <laughs> yeah. People, are not are not behaving well uh, in their in their interactions with people. Yeah. So whatever whatever we can do with that, as well as curbs and signs and stoplights, um, will is needed to address the problem. Really. Yeah, and um, you know, remembering uh, reminding people how to be considerate of one another and. Uh, pay pay attention to your impacts to the the people around you. Yeah, uh, that's that's something um, that we can't relearn fast enough. Um, you know, it's uh, Chief Diaz says says that says this about um, the increase in 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 interpersonal violence in in the city. Um, mm. He right. he says that. Um, Interpersonal skills are a, a perishable asset, which means if you don't practice how to behave with one another, you lose the capacity mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, 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 re I repeat, I repeat that, that that phrase that social social skills are a perishable asset. Um, a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. I'm going to put a pause there. Uh, I know we've got one hand raised, but I'm going to put a pause there on questions. Um, I want to make sure that um, Council Member Herbold has an opportunity to talk a little bit about, um, you know, anything she knows at the moment, um, looking ahead to confirmation process. Uh, for sure. The, the I, director. I know a little bit, um, maybe not any more than you. Um, Council Member Peterson has announced the schedule. Um, he is um, planning on hearing uh, the confirmation over two committee meetings, the first uh, on August 16th and second um, on September 6th. And typically the way those meetings go is that first meeting um, is not a lot of grilling from council members. It's the executive's opportunity. Um, usually one of the deputy mayors will come in at, to sort of introduce the candidate to, to council members and explain council members why that particular individual um, is, is the person that they're, that they're nominating. The second committee meeting is, um, you know, in between the two, the council will um, will prepare our, our own questions that we'll send to uh, the candidate in advance, and um, uh, Mr. Spots will have an opportunity to respond to those in writing. We'll include the answers to the questions in um, all of our official uh, confirmation uh, paperwork, the clerk file that nominates, um, that, that approves the, the, the nomination, confirms him. Um, and, you know, usually we kind of highlight some of the questions that, um, that were asked and answered in, in that written back and forth, or we'll do some follow-up questions if we didn't really like an answer or, or that we, sometimes we like an answer, but we want, we want to get that person on record saying what they told us, saying it publicly. Um, council members can add questions. Like I said, this is um, Council Member uh, Peterson will uh, uh, distribute a memo to council members and invite us to include our questions. So if you have, uh, not today, because I'm not taking notes, but um, if you have questions um, that you want to get in the hopper and make sure get asked, de definitely send them my way. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy to add them. Um, you, uh, you know that uh, Newell is my able my able aide on transportation issues, so um, uh, copy copy him as well. Um, and I don't think I need to tell you anything about Mr. Spots background. It's 
there have been a couple of newspaper articles um, about him already. Um, but it'll be good to have um, it'll be good to have a um, a permanent um, transportation director again. Um, if folks uh, there's, have... a, there's a question yeah. about uh, my question, uh, what what my what my questions are likely to be. Yeah. Um, I think um, my questions are really going to focus um, on um, both how we can um, get more funding for uh, transportation safety projects. I'm I'm really passionate about pedestrian safety, and I want to the city. I want to see the city do more um, around fixing our sidewalks. Um, you know, we talk about the areas that don't have sidewalks, and that's important. Um, but there are um, areas that have sidewalks that in those sidewalks are just very, very unsafe. We're under a consent decree for um, the lack of curb ramps right now, federal government. Um, and I haven't, you know, I've in the past um, uh, with the advocacy of rooted in um, Rooted in Rights, I think that's is I think that's the name, Marcy. Um, we uh, worked on a resolution together to have SDOT come back to us to make some proposals about how to fund sidewalk re repairs. And we got a we got a great academic report from the University of Washington, or yeah, I think it was the University of Washington. And then the city auditor did another report that basically said all the things that the report that we paid for said uh, about how we can actually generate funds um, to do sidewalk repairs. Um, and it's sort of a combination of holding uh, people responsible uh, for fixing their own sidewalks with um, with financial tools that allow them to do so affordable affordably um, and a grant program for uh, folks who can't afford to do it. Um, so I'm gonna be interested in hearing uh, whether or not we can have a commitment from our new director to implement some of those recommendations. Um, I'm also really interested in asset management because of our own experience with, with our bridge. Um, and um, our experience with our bridge has made me um, uh, a passionate um, champion of funding to fix bridges throughout, throughout the city. This is another topic that we have, um, you know, we commissioned a, a, a city audit uh, both on the conditions of the bridges and what we should be doing about it and how we should be um, investing in repairing bridges. And I'm really, I get frustrated because um, there seems to be an unnecessary um, conflict um, between people who are advocates uh, for, for pedestrians, people who are advocates for uh, uh, for bikes and people who are ad advocates for transit um, and people who drive their cars and bridges are necessary for all modes of transportation. Um, and don't forget, don't let's not forget freight, right? Um, so I've always felt like asset management when it comes to bridges is something that champions of all modes of champ, uh, transportation should really be getting getting behind together. Um, and so that's that's gonna be really, um, I think the focus of, of just responding to the question now, I'm sure I'll have more after a little bit more thought, but um, sort of on the spot responding to that question, that's that's um, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm noodling on sending his way. I think you touched on this a little bit here in, in sort of suggesting maybe we need programs to help assist uh, folks in the city. But um, Mark asked, uh, I thought the maintenance of a sidewalk is the responsibility of the abutting property owner. Um, and I can definitely share a story. Um, you know, just yesterday, um, I, I had to help an individual in Southeast Seattle mm -hmm. who took the 50 Route 50 East West. Um, got off on Alaska, which is the major arterial right there. Um, the, the bus driver did what he was supposed to do. He was trying to transfer from the 50 to the 7. 
um, needed to go downhill a block. But if he had managed that by himself, he probably would have tossed himself into traffic on Alaska because the sidewalk's not really great there. Um, and so I, I'm glad I'm still fairly able and I was, you know, going downhill towards there anyway. So I made sure to get him to the bus stop. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is somebody who was coming from his appointment at the VA. He was not the sort of person who was really equipped to navigate less than perfect sidewalks. So right. it's a pretty yeah. big deal. Yeah, and Mark is absolutely correct. Um, the issue is that this, unless we are giving people tools for um, affordable repairs to their sidewalks, the city is hesitant on um, on finding people basically. And so the, the recommendations from both um, the UW and the city auditor is to develop a suite of, of financial tools to help people access low interest loans for those who can afford to, um, to improve what is an, something that they're responsible for, um, but also um, grants for um, homeowners low income seniors, et cetera, who may not be able to um, afford. And then it's also, there's also the development of new, new ways of, um, of fixing sidewalks. And I um, have to give um, SDOP a little bit of credit on the fact that, well, not a little bit, I, I have to give SDOP credit. <laughs> that sounded a little dismissive. I didn't mean it that way. Um, because they have been, um, they've been doing a lot more of um, a, um, and they and they've been doing it themselves um, around particular locations that are particularly hazard. They're, they're doing um, a bevel and trim repair, which is a uh, much less expensive way of um, in areas where the two two panels of sidewalks aren't aren't um, level. It, yeah, it, it allows them to, um, you know, in a low, again, a low cost and expedient quick way to make them align so they're safe to, to walk across and people don't trip. All right. Um, do we have a couple of questions um, around? Uh, what are we talking about? So <laughs> we, we kind of strayed away from the director, but around a director process or priorities that should be put in front of. Uh, the new director and S dot. Um, uh, Kate, I think we have a comment from Don, and then maybe a question from Mark. And I'll just read out Don's comment for everybody. Um, yes, for bridges, West Seattle Bike Connections actively supported the grant applications for Lander Street Bridge to get West Seattle folks and freight over the railroad tracks. And I've used it many times. <laughs> uh, Mark. Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm a, I'll tell you, I'm really frustrated with SDOT. Uh, I was told that they had a technical speed study on West Marginal Way to justify lowering from 40 to 30 miles per hour. No such study was ever conducted. Traffic control that's not credible reduces safety. I wrote a letter to the council in 2016, then Ed, Mary, and uh, the council, and testified at a public meeting that changing numbers on a sign itself would not improve safety. In fact, we had the most deaths in 2021 than we did in 2006. And so when you post 25 mile an hour speed limits on arterial streets that the 85th percentile speed is 40 or 45 miles per hour, there's no credibility to that and it reduces safety. It's not improving safety. Admiral Way, Admiral Hill coming up the hill is a four lane arterial street. It's got the same posted speed limit as uh, as California Avenue, which, you know, I had no issue with changing the 30 to 25 on California, but on the principal arterials, why does the city restrict itself? 35 mile an hour speed limit is, would be appropriate on many arterials, principal arterials. There's nothing wrong with 30 mile per hour limit on all principal arterials. Why does the city think that changing a speed limit from 30 on 4th Avenue to 25 is going to improve safety. It's not. It's going to make things worse. I mean, people are not, it's not credible. And when the city tells me you have a study and then doesn't produce it, I feel like I was lied to. Heather said there was a study. I begged the city to provide me such a study. No such study ever was produced. So there, it, I've been doing this for over 30 years. This is not, you know, traffic control that's not credible does not improve safety. Um, you know, I, I believe I was told also that there was a speed study done for, for West Marginal Way. 
Um, and I know Don was really super involved in those those discussions when they no, were. They did uh, speed. They, they didn't do a technical study that says, here's all these accidents. You know, we got the posted speed limit of 40 miles per hour. Here's all the accidents. And, you know, they didn't do a complete study that justified the lowering of the speed limit. They did nothing. They said, hey, we're just going to change the numbers on a sign without technical justification. No professional engineer signed the report. It was never signed by a professional engineer. And I gave the city a, an example report of how it's done properly. Well, I think it's partially because it was a it was a citywide decision. They're not going to they're not going to policy. Right. It was a citywide it's decision a, based for on all technical arterials. Science. So it, so the fact that it was a citywide decision for all arterials means that you're not going to do specific location studies because you're making the decision for all arterials in the city. They've phased in the signage gradually over time. But um, I mean, again, the larger principle is, is if you are hit by, and I, I know you know this, Mark, um, if you are hit by a vehicle, either as a pedestrian or a bicyclist at a lower speed, um, you're much more likely to survive. Um, the, the, the percentage, the survival percentage rates are in, inc incredibly different between uh, 25 and, um, and 35. Um, and I, I recognize that there's a credibility issue when, when people exceed the, the, the posted speed limit. And I, I catch myself going faster than I should be going. And I'm really grateful coming up my hill that I when, when, when the reader signs are working, <laughs> cause you know, it's a, it's a good reminder. I, I, I don't, sometimes the, as you, as you, as you say, Mark, because we haven't done some of the engineering around the streets that, um, that are, that's very con engineering that can, that can be very controversial that forces people to slow down. All we have are the are are the are the the speed limits, and I think most people want to drive the speed limit. But if a street feels like it should be driven uh, at a at a, a higher speed because it's not designed differently, what we have are signs, <laughs> and we and we should do everything we can to um, to remember what the speed limit is. And um, well, and is, is there is there. I don't know what it would be, but is there is there room? Is there something that the council can get involved with? Because I feel like this this uh, goes back to some of the things that Don had brought up earlier in some of his comments, mm -hmm. where like, you know, where we have slogans, and so you know, was is it a good thing to just do a big citywide initiative? across the board, pat ourselves on the back and be all like, wow, we did a great thing mm -hmm. and, and not look at individual areas and specific arterials or specific crossings. And then also, I think he kind of highlighted like, right, like we can't just say we're going to do things. We need to figure out how are we going to come up with money to back that up with infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, because I think what we're seeing, I mean, certainly for us here in West Seattle, West Marginal Way is a key example where we just put up some signs, which are really cheap, but the road didn't change at all. Yep. And so a lot of people have continued to exhibit behavior just the way they did before. Mm -hmm. And it actually feels really unsafe for those of us who are trying to alter to new behavior yeah because yep. now we we feel like we're the ones being unsafe or yeah. you know folks who like we're we're encouraging you know more families like go over there and use the pedestrian crossing and use the the bike trail and cars are flying faster mm -hmm. than perhaps we want them doing on uh, uh, next to bike trails um and so how is there is there a path down the middle perhaps um, that, that we can start to address some of these things because it feels like we're setting unrealistic expectations. Um, but in this case, it's literally putting people in harm's way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think, I don't, know, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a middle ground, but again, um, we're signing roads for slower speeds that don't feel like they're designed for slower speeds. And so it's the 
the road designs that need to change, and I know this is really controversial. I remember the the channelization project on 35th and how ugly that got. Um, but those that's the thing that reminds people in a way that isn't like, oh, I've been going over the speed limit and I have a reader board that's reminding me I need to slow down. That's the 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 way you enter into a roadway with a different attitude is when the, the street is designed differently. Um, and I know um, under the previous administration, um, there's some plans that um, again are very controversial uh, for for West uh, West Marginal. Um, if you know, we can all get together on the same page and um, about about those changes, in, including um, with our partners at the port. Um, if we could all get on the same page and let the new administration know that um, we're supportive of making some of those changes to make people go slower on West Marginal Way, that's a win. Um, looks like we've got a comment and another hand. We've got kind of a discussion in the um, chat. So let's go to Nathan's question. Yeah, so um, I'm actually an immigrant from Australia. Um, and one of the things that's always struck me about, I think it's a West Coast thing, is, is the fact that no one pays attention to the speed limit. Um, you know, on the freeway, it's safer to go 10 miles above the speed limit because that's what everyone else is doing. Um, the difference, as far as I see it, is not signs and it's not design of roads, it's enforcement. It's, you know, back home, there are fixed cameras all over the place that check mm -hmm. speed, send out fines automatically. There are cop cars that get placed out with the cameras. Like, why is that not a factor here as well? We have, um, uh, in our state law, we have some limitations on how, how, how much we can use both uh, red light cameras and speed cameras. So we have like a fixed number that we're allowed to have of each in the city. Um, I, I, it's, it's a topic that um, we've actually just um, asked for some analysis from SDOT on uh, the state law that creates those limits, um, says that we can only have speed cameras um, in um, school zones. And um, there's one other location, uh, one other type. What was it? Park areas. That's the new one. Oh, the new one that came in. Yeah, up. and that was just uh, this this past legislative session that finished up in 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 April, I guess. Um, and so we're looking to to know more about what a park area is. Do they literally mean the road through a park, or do they mean roads near parks? Um, because that will give us some more flexibility for uh, for more camera enforcement. And the, the nice thing about, um, you know, regardless of how you feel about camera enforcement, the one nice thing about camera enforcement is, um, there are a couple of nice things about camera enforcement. One, I mean, the, the, the fact that we're not having to use police resources to do enforcement in those instances is, is helpful. But the other thing is that the, the revenue uh, generated by camera enforcement is required legally to go into traffic safety uh, projects. It doesn't go into the general fund to use for whatever it is we want we want to use. So we're going to be looking to see um, how we can expand the use of of cameras in parklands using this this new authority. Um, our um, State Rep Joe Fitzgibbons has uh, was oh I remember the other thing because of his work, um, he he was uh, really helpful uh, two legislative sessions ago after many many years of um, actually I guess it was three because it was before the bridge um, before the bridge closed uh, he was successful in expanding to uh, camera enforcement to be used um, to enforce um, bus bus, uh, make sure that single use vehicles, single occupancy vehicles are not in transit lanes. Um, so that's that's uh, one item. And then also for blocking, uh, blocking the box when um, drivers are um, past the intersection and uh, making it dangerous for pedestrians to cross because they're they're stopped past the, the introduction uh, the, the intersection. So that's another area. But the upshot is we're we're really limited 
in um, in how we can use automated camera enforcement by state law, and as it relates to um, police enforcement, um, and this is not. I mean, one we have uh, 400 police officers in the last two and a half years have left the department, um, so we have uh, a police department that is really focused on responding to 911 calls. That's their their main mission right now. But even before that. Um, I uh, I would always bring this up with our prior Southwest Precinct Captain, uh, Kevin Grossman. I bring it up with uh, uh, the current Southwest Precinct Captain, uh, uh, Martin Rivera. Um, I will give him locations where there's frequent speeding and I, I'm, they, they'll they tell me that they'll put that on their sort of their route that they, that, that location on their route that they, that they monitor. But they are, they're, loathe to use enforcement as a way to change behavior because they also uh believe that uh how you en engineer the road is really the way to have a long-standing um change on driver behavior all right thank you um i know you have uh somewhere else you need to be tonight um but do you have just a few minutes to share any thoughts you have on um Sound Transit Board decisions um, heading into the final EIS and some of the comments that you offered um, yeah. about the alternatives um, in Del Ridge and Avalon? Sure. Um, so um, people probably uh, already know because you're uh, transportation wonks, but today the uh, Sound Tran Transit Board the preferred alternative uh, for the for the draft EIS. Um, the medium tunnel to 41st uh, for the junction, uh, the Andover Street uh, lower height station for Delridge and the South Crossing for Duwamish. Um, these, these options are, um, according to Sound Transit Analysis, affordable within their financial plan. Um, Councilmember McDermott actually raised this specific question during the meeting today and got confirmation um, about the the specific um, uh, West Seattle recommendations and the affordability because um, the issue is affordability because Sound Transit is a regional body and there are uh, board members who do not represent the city much less um, West Seattle though we're very lucky to have people from West Seattle um, the affordability question for the whole system is is important to other board members. Um, the board identified um, areas for further study, um, shifting the uh, junction station to 42nd, eliminating the Avalon station, uh, a pedestrian bridge cross Andover, um, and then they also looked at, um, uh, are, are going to look at the question of shifting the alignment south towards um, southwest Yancey. Um, was glad to hear um, some um, acknowledgement of um, the impacts in the um, by by both Sound Transit staff and the um, expansion committee chair Balducci. Um, there was acknowledgement of the uh, of the concern around impacts on the Del Six um, uh, option. So um, you know that's that's a result again of of advocacy. Um, they uh, one. Uh, location and uh, one impact in particular is the uh, impact to uh, transitional resources, um, and so um, and and we all know about the the impacts to um, the childcare facility. So um, shifting the alignment south towards Yan Yancey uh, might um, spare the main transitional resources site. Um, so they're clearly taking it seriously. Um, and I think much of what we did at the city level when the city passed our resolution, um, you know, we didn't, the, the point of not expressing um, a preference for, for uh, Del 6, which was what the executive's original recommendation is, is re was really to create more room um, to make sure that Sound Transit understood that the city is, is was serious about wanting to preserve uh, the um, 
the homelessness and uh, uh, behavioral health resources and transitional resources, but also to, um, to mitigate the impacts to the child care facility. Um, and really, um, you know, because South Transit sort of talks about their mitigation um, strategies in a pretty, pretty narrow way um, as, as far as like financial uh, uh, compensation for those impacts. And so I, 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 I believe by not expressing a preference, we create more room for um, the stakeholders who care about those impacted community resources to negotiate um, more with, with Sound Transit against those things. So um, really uh, appreciative that um, uh, we had we had help from, um, from from the mayor's office and executive and uh, transportation chair um, Peterson in, in delivering that message. All right. Thank you very much. And we're approaching 750. Do you, do you have, Nathan, is your question short? Do you have a moment to, to let Nathan have one last question? All sure. right. You got the last question, Nathan. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I want to thank uh, Council Member Bob for, for your work advocating for the, the no preference option in Seattle City Council. Um, obviously, things didn't go the way we wanted today. Um, they have said they're going to be considering refinements. Does the Seattle City Council have any levers they can pull to push what those refinements can be? Um, you know, I don't know if you saw the meeting today, but like half the comments, and the comments went on for an hour and a half, but half of them were talking about extending the WSJ 5 tunnel. Yeah. Um, we're not going to repeat that conversation, but like, are there any levers that, that the council has um, to push what refinements should be studied? You know, I, I, my, my, I think my comments around affordability um, and frankly, Council Member McDermott's comments around affordability um, is if you read between the lines, um, yes, we can ask uh, for re refinements to be considered, but um, we know that the full uh, Sound Transit Board is really um, going to be focused on um, the budget and um, the you know the budget for the whole system and um, the ref if ref refinements that are that have a really big price tag. Um, it we can ask, but it's um, it's like Cepheus pushing the rock up the mountain. <laughs> True, it's, but if I can comment on that, so they chose the WSJ five tunnel because of property prices, but they're not doing the math to see whether the Avalon tunnel would also, like we're not selling them they should do it. We're asking, can you look into it? Can you look into it? Yeah. I mean, I'm. they voted today on, on the refinements that they all agree to. Uh, and, I, you know, I think, again, the, the folks who are your best likely advocates, um, because of their position and their representation of you um, as a West Seattleite, our um, Executive Constantine and Councilmember McDermott, mm -hmm. if 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 they can't convince their colleagues, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Because they, I mean, they're they're on a they're on a body with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they they share the decision making, but that doesn't mean I can't try. I'm just trying to be realistic of about what I think is possible. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if the, if the city could give any record. Like, I just wanted to know what the options were. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure thing. Right. Well, Thanks I for having me, you guys. I promised Alex I'd let you out before eight. So thank you very much for hanging out with us. Good seeing well, everybody. Good to have you here. All right. Keep cool. All right. All right. So we have a few more. Uh, things to go over. Hopefully folks will hang out with us a little bit longer. Um, got some fun pictures and things to show. Um, if folks are not aware, um, part of our exciting transportation shenanigans in Seattle, um, there was an airplane crash off of Alki um, earlier this week. 
Um, I have not seen a whole lot of details yet in the news, which surprised me. Uh, the pilot did walk away um, or swim away, I guess, at first um, and didn't have any serious sustainable injuries. Um, it looks, if you've seen video, it looks like he was intentionally trying to engage, engage in an emergency landing, uh, which if so, he did a marvelously phenomenal job coming down right along the water and in an area where there wasn't anything to sort of put anyone in danger, but it certainly startled a lot of people along the beach who caught video and photos. And so this was uh, the aftermath there before it sank. Um, I believe it has been taken out already, but- Yeah, it's been, it was so. removed yesterday. Um, so a couple more things on the agenda. Um, we'll have a, a, I put discussion, we can talk if people have questions, but I'm gonna run through a couple of other big things um, that have come up here in the last uh, few days, some of which we've already covered in the meeting. Um, we'll quickly talk about old business, any new business and adjourn. Um, Kate, I see things coming in in the chat. Is there anything we need to pause on or? You need to read Don's comment. <laughs> Why is uh, the Seattle Transportation Coalition not advocating for air water taxi service? <laughs> um, I would love to have air water taxi. And I, and I know we have people in West Seattle who are big advocates for, uh, you know, slingshotting people again yeah. across the water. So we can always go for that too. And Tracy says an oil pressure problem was the yeah. cause or potentially. All right. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, this. Uh, first headline I have up here is uh, Mayor Harrell nominates Greg Spots to be the next director of Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, Seattle deserves a transportation system that is safe, reliable, and equitable. And our SDOT director is instrumental in implementing that vision. Greg understands that we must embed safety across all projects view every decision through a climate lens and build a transportation system centered on equity, quality infrastructure and multimodal solutions. At least that's what Mayor Harrell said in his press conference introducing Greg. Um, he continued, Greg is a champion for innovative thinking, sustainable solutions, collaborative partnership building and transparent public engagement. My sincere thanks to Interim Director Kristen Simpson for her tremendous leadership and willingness to step up to keep critical projects and priorities on track. I know she's excited to help the new director hit the ground running during this transition period. Um, so uh, we already heard from uh, the council member about what the confirmation process is gonna start to look like heading out into September, but apparently Greg will be with us um, uh, as soon as September 6th, I think the date was. Um, so I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna try to work some magic and see if we can't pull pull off getting Greg as a guest at our September meeting. Well, we'll, we'll see if I can call in some favors with some colleagues. Um, these are some of the things that uh, I pulled uh, about Greg. I won't read all of that, um, but he, uh, he currently serves uh, in LA as the executive officer and chief sustainability officer for the Bureau of Street Services. Um, he, he's been very active in active transportation. He has a, uh, he seems to have a rep for being really interested in working with neighborhood groups, which sounds pretty good, uh, you know, possibly for us. Um, he's uh, led three constituent facing divisions down there. Um, launched the city's first bike lane cleaning and maintenance program, um, as well as pushing for a zero emissions electric sweeper. Um, and he's identified new investments in underserved communities, including mobility improvements, tree planting, solar reflective pavement coatings to reduce urban heat, and new median islands featuring native plants that support diversity. So these all sound like the sort of things that we're excited to point out um, at the neighborhood level and in our wonky ways. So, you know, uh, 
I'm a little disappointed that we're getting another white guy from a big West Coast city or a big coastal city, I should say. But, you know, it sounds like he might really be our wonky environmental kind of person that we want. So um, but we'll see what we have to learn from him. Um, anybody have any thoughts or questions or anything they've learned or heard about him? All right, I will keep us moving forward here then. Um, um, next headline up, uh, it, I, I certainly hope no one in West Seattle has missed this, but just in case, um, the latest post-tensioning work has dramatically increased the West Seattle Bridge's strength, moving us closer to reopening. Um, as SDOT shared, the West Seattle Bridge is scheduled to reopen as soon as the week of September 12th, though they caution a project of this scope might encounter unforeseen challenges. Um, but let's, let's hope it'll just be a matter of, uh, you know, what, five and a half weeks, maybe, and we might be up on that bridge again, and then we can all go back to complaining about traffic on the bridge instead of traffic on the detours. Um, because and, and I want to caution, I'm not doing this to be mean in any way, but I think we have developed a close enough relationship with her that I thought it was amusing to grab this uh, screen capture. Um, I thought I would share our good friend Heather Marks um, there inside the bridge with her hard hat. Uh, if you want to see the video, you can find the video on, uh, I believe, all, both on SDOT's uh, bridge program page as well as in one of their recent blog entries. Um, but I think she looks very fabulous there in her emergency protective gear. Um, so hopefully we will have her out uh, maybe also in September to talk about how the reopening went and how everything's looking with traffic on the bridge again. She narrated, Heather narrated that segment on post-tensioning and uh, you know, those are crazy words to try and say and on camera, she did a great job. One of the things I will point out, since we're a wonky transportation group, and I know some, some media, like our own local media folks, um, have been good about it, but a lot of people don't appreciate that, you know, some of what's being done here, it's, it, it's, it's not radical and crazy and, you know, and unusual. The bridge was planned to have this kind of post-tensioning work done in it. Um, if anything, perhaps maybe we should have work to do it sooner, although presumably we would have still had to close down a bridge and nobody would have wanted that. Um, but we're definitely doing things that the bridge was designed to do. And so hopefully this really will be a good solid uh, patch job to keep us going for a while. Um, and then finally, um, as we were talking about, the Sound Transit Board meeting uh, with, was this afternoon. Uh, the, the, uh, it sounds like maybe Nathan was keeping an eye on it. I don't know if other folks here were keeping an eye on it, but uh, the board was expected to vote on the West Seattle routing and station locations for final environmental studies, um, which would be followed by a final decision likely next year. Um, these are um, a couple of slides from the materials that they released pre-meeting um, regarding the West Seattle link extension. Um, that the preferred alternative for the West Seattle Link Extension is West Seattle Junction Segment, the Medium Tunnel, 41st Avenue Station. Uh, the, in the Delridge Segment, the Andover Street Station, Lower Height, Del 6. Uh, and in the Duwamish Segment, the South Crossing um, across the river. Um, and Soto segment as well. Um, and as they stated on their materials, and as a uh, uh, council member Herbold pointed out that these alternatives are affordable within the realigned uh, finances. Um, so at least as far as this goes, what is being proposed by the board is all affordable without third party funding. So presumably if there are, if there are additional things that we might want to do around this, um, we may have to find others to toss some money in. Um, but, but our baseline has definitely moved, I think, perhaps in the right direction from where it was affecting uh, several of our neighborhoods before. Um, and then uh, she mentioned a couple of other things um, that, that were targeted for further studies. Um, I, I'm sorry, this is probably hard for people to see any details, but this is, this is the slide as it was 
put out ahead of time. Um, but a couple of other things that were that were proposed for study, and I'm assuming were approved, um, is looking at shifting the station entrance to 42nd in the junction. Um, they are apparently going to officially look at what it would mean to eliminate Avalon Station and how that would impact ridership and other things um, here in this section or in the, in our segment. Um, a pedestrian bridge across Andover Street or shifting the alignment south towards Southwest Yancey Street. Um, and then looking at, there's some comments there about looking at Soto. Um, but I, I'm assuming that post meeting, we'll be able to see some closer details on, on, on what some of this would look like. Um, and, and that's what I have uh, for those headlines. Um, again, looking ahead to September, um, hopefully we might be able to pull uh, sound transit folks in to talk about all the final things that were made, particularly because there, there are still some decisions hanging out there around um, what they're going to do in Chinatown and what they're going to do in Soto. Um, so they're not, they haven't fully committed to everything yet moving into the final EIS. Um, do we have any comments, questions in the chat, any sort of thing around, around those before we uh, proceed into old and new business? Since our next meeting will be, I'm just being an optimist, after the bridge is already reopened, uh, do we know if there's been movement on a reopening walk, scoot, et cetera, across the bridge? Uh, okay. You know, Tracy has been keeping an eye on that. So. Yeah, she might be able to drop some info, but the latest we heard seemed to be that like there's not going to be a walk or a run because they want flexibility to open as soon as possible with the bridge and they don't want to be locked down to a date if they could open a couple of days earlier. Um, Deb here, I just want to let folks know that I've been serving on a uh, the people who want to party on the bridge and they were finally told, thank heavens, no, you are not going to be allowed to be on the bridge. Not happening, no way, no how. So the, the group is pivoting. Uh, ESTAD is actually giving a uh, community, uh, the South Park community, the High, Highland Park community, and the general West Seattle community, uh, $10,000 to celebrate as they celebrate or uh, commemorate as they need to. So there's different things that are coming up and uh, still in the planning area. I'm not sure all the different things that uh, South Park may be doing um, or Highland Park, but uh, no one's going to go on a fun ride on the bridge other than in your car or the bus. Sorry, the bus. There you go. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I see more things coming into the chat, but I can't see the chat at the moment. So. It's links and uh, right. clarifications on that. Mainly Tracy yeah. was telling me I should have read the news on Monday. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, Tracy. Yeah. So it's, it, it's been kind of an ongoing thing. There will be um, different commemoration uh, objects there there's uh, some glass balls there's different uh, ways to talk about how you survive the bridge closure so the group is trying to uh, unite West Seattle and also welcome people back to West Seattle and it's an interesting uh, group of marketing people <laughs> uh, and uh, chamber folks uh, junction folks um, a lot of folks who have suffered, uh, business owners who have suffered during the bridge closure along with the pandemic. So interesting group. I just like sitting and watching. All right. Um, moving into old business, I will remind folks um, that we adopted a meeting schedule change at our last meeting. Um, and this is, this is officially the start of that. So we've moved to a bi-monthly schedule of meetings. Um, so membership meetings are, are on our monthly membership meetings are, are now on odd months, um, January, March, May, July. This is the July meeting. So our next meeting will be September 22nd. 
And then looking ahead after that, um, November, of course, normally we would fall smack on Thanksgiving, um, which would make for a very interesting uh, transportation uh, coalition meeting. But since all of us would rather be with, you know, family or friends and not staring at each other, uh, talking about uh, how fast everyone's driving on West Marginal Way, um, normally we move a week earlier. Um, so I would ask uh, for a motion from one of the board members uh, to officially move our meeting to November 17th. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so, uh, so mark, mark your calendars now for those upcoming dates. And as soon as we get some program things in, in, in line, we'll, we'll get that out to everybody. Um, and so uh, for even months, um, we're keeping our board meetings on even months um, and now making that the fourth Thursday as well um, to keep us all in that calendar rhythm. Uh, so if folks are ever wondering what the board's talking about or wanting to pitch something directly to our board members, um, uh, let us know. Um, we we tend to meet virtually still um, for board as well, and so there may be an opportunity for you to join us uh, for a short time to pitch things or or see what we're up to. Uh, I see Larry's hand raised. Oop, you're on mute, Larry. Oh, wait. We can't hear you, Larry. Why is that? In the chat. All right. Um, no. All right. Well, Larry, you might have to drop it in the chat, in which case I will. Uh, oh, maybe he's going to try and dial back in. <laughs> Um, what do we got going? What do we got going on in the chat right now, Kate? Anything we need to chit chat? Oh. Um, well, hopefully we will hear from Larry here in a moment. Um, yep. But that is all. That is all I had there for our slides. Um, okay. Do we have any new business? Oh, yes. go ahead. I met uh, uh, Morgan Community Association had the new uh, city traffic engineer um, who replaced the gentleman, Dong Ho. So he's, uh, Dung Ho was his mentor. And once again, second time today, I've forgotten the guy's name, but uh, he came out and spoke to Morgan Community Association about the California and Finley improvements, which had been in the works prior to the fatality. And um, I was pleased that they were in, you know, thinking about it. It's still not gonna do anything to, uh, It'll be for the intersection and not really per se where the gentleman died, uh, which was outside of the intersection. But uh, he may be somebody, I, I warned the guy, I said, probably you need to come to the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. So uh, there we go. Work on that unless Mark, you want to invite him. I haven't met him yet. Okay. We love to have wonky traffic engineers. So. I know, he is definitely wonky. I mean, if anybody wants to see what, uh, unfortunately, years of advocacy <laughs> um, result, but, um, but, you know, infrastructure changes, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who don't like the changes that uh, happened on Del Ridge Way, um, but a lot of us in the neighborhood are very happy with some of the fact that we've got a landscape median that makes us look like, you know, a real neighborhood like they get in North Seattle, or uh, that people can't use the center lane now to go flying down the road and speeding around everybody. Um, and uh, some more extensive bus lanes. And, um, 
you know, narrower lanes to slow people down. And uh, I would love to see more bike riders, but it seems like we have a rash of people walking in the bike lane on Del Ridge, which is a very strange and odd sort of thing. Um, but uh, so a but, mail truck in the bike lane the other day too. Yes, um, but uh, but you know, uh, we'll we'll see how things do as the as the bridge opens up. Um, yeah. But uh, that that took many years of advocacy by the on the part of the neighborhoods to finally get all that in order. Going to be interesting come September. Okay. I assume there's no update on fiscal sponsorship of this organization. Uh, oh, we I attended that. a meeting, and Phil's not here, and he's the one driving that car. Yes. But um, I attended a meeting with Admiral Neighborhood Association and told them what their fiscal sponsorship uh, requirements are since the majority of the folks who are now on the board have never dealt with that, but they didn't have any qualms about it, just knowing they just needed Morgan, sorry, they just needed WSTC to uh, connect with them and, and maybe have some ideas about what the money would be used for, et cetera, so. Sounds like we should uh, focus on that for our August board meeting. There we go. Um. I'll make a motion to adjourn. It's been a long day. Um, oh, actually, um, one, one last bit of speaking of board stuff, one last bit of board business before we adjourn, um, because uh, I believe we've got a quorum here, correct? Yes. Um, and Don and Marcy. Uh, we did we did not elect officers um, at our board retreat because we were one short of a quorum. That's right. Um, so. Um, uh, I have offered to stick around as chair. Um, John Wright has um, graciously offered to step up to be vice chair. Yeah, John! Uh, I, I think Kate's title is secretary, correct? And she has offered to stay on. And then Larry is technically our treasurer, but until we have some fiscal sponsorship going on, he's been... Um, admirably serving as um, somewhat of our meeting uh, wrangler um, for guests and things um, and doing a pretty good job of it, especially with the, with the craziness that um, some, not, not council member Herbold, but some of the other council members staff and the mayor staff have been putting him through over the last month or two. Um, so, um, and, and they have both agreed to, to continue on. Um, so if someone who is not one of the four of us um, could make a motion to um, elect us um, as officers for this uh, this next year. That'd be great. I move the slate of officers as proposed by Michael Taylor Judd. Is there a second? Second the motion. Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? All right, now I can run away at any time and make John be in charge of everything. Woo John, yay. <laughs> um, so and thank you, I John. Uh, just so you know, I just let Larry in again. Maybe he has um, oh, body or... <laughs> he, he didn't want All to be right. <laughs> Larry, Larry, are you there with us? Larry. Can we, we hear you? you? And we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't know. That's one of those days, Larry. Maybe but Larry, we, we just reelected you as an officer and we thank you for being an amazing meeting wrangler, so. Yep. Okay. Can I uh, second Mark's- uh, Adjourn? Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, all right, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. or just click the button and <laughs> disappear. <laughs> All right. Everybody have a nice evening. Hopefully, uh, you know, things cool off next week, like they say it's going to. Yeah. Yes, and it will be back that to normal no by Sunday. I did smell some smoke, a little bit of smoke the other day. Not much, but. All right. All right. On wood. Everybody have a nice evening, and hopefully we'll be driving on the bridge soon. Yep. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Good night.